So hello and welcome to the Think Global Forum Roundtable event. We do appreciate you joining us today. As some of you may already know, uh, the Think Global Forum has been going for many years now, and we started off as an in-person conference-style events program running across many major cities in the USA, which we then expanded into Europe as well. Uh, typically, the format of a Think Global Forum, if you haven't joined us before, is we normally do these in uh, quite plush uh, hotels. And uh, we do them there where we, we're obviously in New York or London or Dublin, Chicago, Los Angeles, Amsterdam, many locations that we've hosted Think Global Forum conferences at. And to hold these in in-person events, we also host a boardroom style session as part of the Think Global Forum. Uh, which have proved to be uh, extremely popular. If you'd like to find out more about the Think Global Forum, I just wanted to say at the top before we get into today's discussion that you can do that at thinkglobalforum.org. So thinkglobalforum.org, if you want to find out a little bit more about the Think Global Forum. And the best way to keep uh, up to date with everything that's going on and whether they're in-person events, week-long summits that we do, or whether they are round tables. If you subscribe to the newsletter, that, that's normally a really good way to keep up to, up to speed with everything that we're doing. And of course, to follow us and follow the Think Global Forum on social media. Now, during the pa pandemic, we moved everything online, as did most people. And we changed the format to hosting these week-long summit events with many high profile keynote speakers. And we also did a few round tables as part of that, which worked really, really well. And we're currently planning at the moment to return to some in-person Think Global Forum events. It's a question that I'm constantly asked about. So we are working on that at the moment. And in addition to these events, of course, we're going to be commencing more virtual round table events that you're all joining us here today. Uh, we have a number of these roundtables planned, and to start us off, uh, we're joined by Jason Cooper today, who's going to share some insights into how storytelling impacts the brain. For those of you that aren't familiar with Jason's background, he's spent over 25 years at this stage helping many people and companies build value uh, through connections and effective relationships. He, he coaches and he trains uh, both individuals and whole sales departments on how to master relationships. And Jason is currently working extensively with Google, a brand I'm sure we all know. He's a certified trainer, he's a sales coach, and he's also somebody that's very focused on business strategy. So when it comes to storytelling, we're glad that Jason is here with us today to share some insights into how storytelling impacts the brain. We're also joined by Doyle Bueller today, and Doyle is a strategy Sherpa. Uh, he's a digital transformation expert, and he's the author of a book called Breakthrough, which helps to explore and unleash remarkable brand value, uh, influence, and authority. So it's great that we have Doyle with us today for the discussion. And we're also going to be joined in a little while by Tamir Kadar. And Tamir is the Chief Marketing Officer at Francis Cooper in London. She's a lecturer at the Northumbria University. And she's also the founder of the London Marketing Agency. And finally, Maria Roja and I here on the Think Global Forum team uh, will join Tamir, Doyle, and of course, Jason, following his presentation to discuss this topic about how storytelling impacts the brain in a little more detail. I do hope we're going to have some time to answer some Q&A from the audience. So feel free to drop any comments you might have into the chat or the, or the questions uh, function on this platform. And we'll do our best to answer some of those towards the end. So let's hand it over to Jason and let's begin the topic of how storytelling impacts the brain. J Jason, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Simon, as always, I always very much appreciate you inviting me. And uh, as we've known each other for the last few years, I um, understand Simon's business he's coming from i'm delighted to be here to present how storytelling affects our brains and before i go on 
uh, let me just see if I can share my screen and hopefully that will come up. Uh, if you give me a big thumbs up, uh, sharing my screen. I go across many different platforms and I get confused about which platform I'm on half the time, whether it's Zoom, whether it's Teams, whether it's whatever else. But really today is excellent. Thanks for that. It's storytelling and how it affects our brain. And it does in many ways. It's a lot of the things that we do, we speak to ourselves all the time and we tell ourselves stories all the time and narratives, whether it's true or whether it's not, we actually make up stuff in our heads, which is uh, fundamental to how the stories that are told to us in a narrative can affect our brain. But before we go any further, I've got to really uh, uh, make you understand the three areas of the brain, but I'll go through that. Look, this is me, like uh, Simon gave me a wonderful introduction. I also um, do a podcast, which is one of, uh, it's a global sales leader podcast. I've interviewed global leaders, people that at the top, at the top of their uh, um, business and their success in lives. So if you want to uh, listen to that. I'm more than happy to uh, share that with you if you want to connect with me uh, via LinkedIn or all the other social media platforms. Like, um, fundamentally, I'm a salesperson, but I've uh, along the way, I've actually got a whole load of skills. Now I train people in how to build effective business relationships with your clients and customer. But I'm also interested about the psychology behind that and the behaviors behind that and people's behaviors and body language and linguistics and also the stories that we tell. So that's fundamental to part of this, what I'm doing today is part of a bigger course that I actually present. But really, let's understand who she is. In the 1960s, a guy called uh, Paul McLean um, analyzed an areas of the brain, but the, the brain is obviously very complex. So the three layer brain. So what is the three layer brain? Let's have a look. We have the neocortex, which is the outer layer of the brain, which takes pretty much 90% of how we think and how we do today. It's, our, it's like a, a central processing unit. So then we have the limbic system. I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about that. It's what we see, what we feel, our beliefs, our values, and then we go into the root brain, which is the inner core of the brain, which is that green area. And that's pretty much our fight, flight, or freeze mechanism. Like when we see um, a snake or back in the day, many years ago, thousands of years ago, we would see a dinosaur and we're with our tribe. We're either going to fight it or we're going to flee or we're going to freeze. But that's really powerful stuff that we have here. It's one of our uh, tools that parts of our brain that protects us. And, you know, that's all part and parcel of how a story can invoke the imagination of ourselves and of our people and of our uh, characters within a story. But let me carry on with that. So the neocortex, lots of different areas. Uh, there's the frontal cortex, the occipital, the temporal lobe. This is the thinking brain. This takes all of the data that we have around in our head. It's our logical, it's our rational thoughts, it's our language, it's our skepticism. It's also our judgment. It's how we judge things. It takes a huge amount of energy of our brain to actually process this. And again, the analogy is, as we always speak in analogies, it's the central processing unit of our brain. It takes a huge amount of energy to actually focus in on this area. So let's have a look at the limbic system. The limbic system is our feeling brain. It's the memory, it's a sociability, it's how our emotions are evoked, but really, and it's our trust and it's our visualization. So, this is a core area to how uh, part and parcel of how we are as humans. We are emotional beings. We're obviously logical, but that's the, the, the neocortex, the newest part of the brain. 
Then we're going to go back into the root brain again. It's our breathing, our hunger, our thirst, our balance, avoidance, and our survival. But again, it's here to protect us, and it's here for our safety. Remember thousands and thousands of years ago, I would say remember thousands of years ago, but none of us were there then. But if you're around the campfire and you had the leader of the tribe, the only way to get them to tell stories from generation to generation to generation is to sit around the fire and the leader would provoke all of this with wonderful stories and wonderful narratives that get passed down from generations two generations, two generations, whether they turn into myths or whether they turn into Chinese whispers or whether they get added on. But that's how we evoked with your imagination. And I'm gonna be speaking about that in a few moments. So how do we, I say it's the buying brain, but it's really, how do we affect people to change? So when I work with uh, professionals, business professionals and sales professionals, and other people like that, the only way I can get straight through to them, I could give them numbers and I can give them logic and I can give them all analytical information. But, you know, that's going to take time and effort for me to process that. And by that time, I've lost them. You know, when you're presented with lots of data, what actually happens to our brain? We take ages and ages and ages to think about things. So if you can connect with someone with a narrative, you work with the inside out, not the outside in. So you've got all the different areas of the brain. So when you present information, when you're doing a presentation, as an example, you don't go with lots and lots of data about, oh, we're wonderful, uh, we've increased the market by 5% and blah, 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 blah. No one wants to know that because you're not evoking any imagination in there. So once you do evoke the imagination, you have to go straight into the central information, the emotion to stir them, to actually buy into what you're suggesting, buy into the idea, you create those emotions. And we're gonna be speaking about that in a few moments, how that works. But I really wanted to make sure that you understand how our brain works. There's lots of different facets around that. In a larger workshop, we'll talk about a lot more in data about how that works. Data, I said data, but I didn't mean to say data. But I want you to go into the chat if you can. What I want you to do when presented with, uh, uh, this was a study by the London School of Business. So there were three groups of students and they're all presented with different information. The first group was given information in statistics, statistical information. Then they asked them the next day how much they remembered. Can you put into the chat how much you think they actually remembered? Can we write into the chat how much do you think they actually remembered when they were presented in a story with data, lots of statistical data? This also goes in uh, with your presentations and what you do when you present to your clients and everything else. Can you put in there what it was? Can we get people to write into the chat? Not very much. Chat disabled. Oh, I apologize about that. Um, not very much, not very, very much. Uh, that goes, goes into the Q&A. Okay, the chat is disabled, but that's absolutely fine. I will keep on carrying on. So, between five and 10% the next day. So think about this when you present your presentations and you put in lots and lots of data on, on the slide. This frustrates the hell out of me. If you're, if you're presenting slides, and you've got lots of graphs and you've got lots of words and you've got lots of everything else. Number one, it's going to go over most people's head. But what I'm passionate about is evoking that memory. So the second part, when you present the same stuff with the second group, they remembered with imagery. And that was 25%. 
that they remember the next day. So what do you think would be done on the, the third group and how much do you think they actually remembered? Uh, let me go into the Q&A. Chat, 20%. Anything else? You can put it into the Q&A. Oh, no, we got the chats open now. So 75%. Someone might have seen this before. So it is actually between 65 and 70%. What I want to do now is take this into another level. And what I mean is I've been studying this area on how visual language can evoke the imagination, can evoke your narrative even more. So I want to take it to another level. So what I want you to do is think of the last time you identified your very first memory or memory that came into mind of your last holiday. What I want you to start to think of is to see the world from a different perspective at the top of a high mountain or something like that. And then you're looking down, and this is from your last memory of your last holiday. Hopefully you all gone on the holiday. What you are doing is you're listening to children shrieking with pleasure as they shout excitedly to their friends. What I want you to remember to lay in on a warm beach, feeling fine, the sand granules running between your hands and your feet and through your fingers. And you're smelling the scents and the perfume of the clear night air as you walk through the restaurants, deciding where to go, deciding what to eat. And the unclouded fumes through the city or through the holiday resort or wherever you might be, savoring different fresh smells and tastes of sizzling foods as you decide what you need and what you'd like to eat. What I want you to do is, did you hear, did you smell, did you taste your memory? Because it's all about evoking your memory here. Chat is enabled here. Thank you, everyone. Chat is enabled. So what I just suggested, did you see, did you hear, did you smell your memory? Go back now and experience it through the rest of your senses. What did you feel? when you were there? What did you touch? What senses are around you? And what did you smell and what did you touch? This all helps you to visualize. And when we, uh, yeah, I'm hungry now. <laughs> yeah. As you were there, using our imagination first. So when we start to visualize using our language and our linguistics in the right way and using our sensory language, to provoke the imagination of the other person as if you were there. This is all part of the story that you can tell. Water about me. Thank you, Anna. So let's take it a little bit further. So this is a loose framework that you can work with. And when I work with people, we break down this framework. So the setting. So this could be a business setting, or if you're creating a story, so the setting is the office, as an example. So the first part, the characters actually within the story. Um, it could be the characters, it could be yourself, it could be your customers, and you're there to present information to them. So this is part of it. So you're getting yourself ready to present your story. So what is the conflict? The conflict is trying to convince them to buy your product, your service, and they're going against it. Then all of a sudden, there's a big idea as you relate information, as you relate the story and the narrative to them. I always like to break it down into Star Wars myself. So number one, the first setting is um, Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia. They're all there in the setting. They're all shooting into the Death Star. The characters are, again, Luke Skywalker, and it's Darth Vader, 
and they're going in and they're the big conflict is the uh the, the dark entity versus um the jedi the big idea is to blow up the death star and the big resolution is they blow up the death star and they happily ever after but you can create this narrative you can create this rough idea of a story framework look it does give you flexibility there's a lots of different frameworks that you can use but in the business context in the sales context it gives you an idea of where you need to go and how you write the idea of how the business became what actually happened within the business and the narrative around that so let's go on. so the different areas who here understands what a metaphor is we use them all the time but subconsciously we just say them as soon as you start to speak to someone we're all using these metaphors all the time we're all using an analogy all the time who has the metaphor I'll give the game away. Uber is the taxi service, while Airbnb is the hotel industry. So when you connect with people, this is another way of really connecting. So you're shortcutting straight to their memory and straight to their emotion. So they get it straight away. When you connect with a story, you connect with a metaphor or analogy is another way round to it. So what is dopamine? Who knows here what dopamine actually is? So once you end a Netflix series or you're like me and yep, dopamine, and you're right there at the edge and you're in a certain high and you go, ah, oh, yes, excellent, excellent. Oh no, it's finished. So you get that instant high. You get that, um, you get that in lots of different areas. Uh, you get that watching TV. You get that what um, in other areas of your life. Yep, neurotransmitter. Thank you, Doyle. Uh, another neuroscience experts in there. Social media. Yep, dopamine. The brain releases dopamine to the system when it experiences an emotionally charged event. You can get that in sports. You can get that in lots of different areas. Well spoken about. How can we create dopamine? in the narrative that we say the cortex activity when processing facts the information is activated you know we talk about the neocortex but we want people to actually start to think about how the the story is constructed and actually look back and just rest in their seat and go wow that's thought-provoking makes you really sticky in the head makes you really sit back and go wow that was incredible. So sensory cortex and the frontal cortex, which is the frontal lobe, which is where the memory actually is. So how you can actually get people to remember you once you've left the area. So cortisol, which is really pretty much the stress course, which is me before I just started here today because Zoom updated and all of a sudden the stress course uh, actually hit my uh, head. So cortisol, the hormone released in responses to stress, which is caused on our, from our fight flight reaction, when we're scared, when there's nothing scary about the role, the cortisol in storytelling, we've all had that in the response to a uh, story or action story, uh, danger, risk, reward, but our brains are kicking in all the time. Too much cortisol is quite bad for you, but enough of it to just keep you there stressed and you're closing your eyes and you're watching something on the TV, but then you just keep looking because we like it in certain instances and it's quite actually good for us in certain ways. It helps us to sweat in our palms through a movie or whatever it might be. Good storytelling really grabs your attention. But when you're presenting that to a client, you want to add in stress. You need to add in areas of stress, of loss, the uh, Chaldean's laws of influence and persuasion. If you put a little bit of stress in there, it does help, but not too much stress because that it does the negative effect. 
So let's have a look at mirror, mirror neurons, which is in the frontal lobe. People like people like themselves when you can connect with them. So your mirror neurons, which is in the frontal part of the brain, helps you see things from their point of view and all your point of view, depending on who's actually doing the speaking. So the mirror neurons are absolutely incredible. Again, when you're actually with a client and you're actually speaking to them and you send a narrative, your client will be jumping inside your brain and experiencing the same thing from their point of view when you've actually done that. Neurocoupling, a story activates parts of the brain that allows the listener to own the ideas. It's their idea. What you are doing is you're helping them create a visualization in their brain to make them understand it from their point of view. So the more you can create that within the neurocoupling area, the more it's going to work for you. So I'm going to quickly go through. Who knows what oxytocin is? You can put it into the chat if you want, if you want to have some interaction. The biggest part of oxytocin, the biggest area of oxytocin is, yep, yeah, absolutely. You actually took the words out of my mouth, used in childbirth. When a child is born to the world and the mother is flooded with oxytocin, it's the area of trust. It's the love hormone. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Oxytocin comes into play in a story where you connect. People like people like themselves, but they like connection. It's the experience and the hopes and desires of the dream of the plot. Even again, once you're having a wonderful time watching a movie on the, on the TV, you can connect with your characters, especially those series that go on forever and a day, like Breaking Bad, which goes up to eight or nine, ten episodes or series. And connecting, you like the people. It is the best drug. Well, I would say serotonin is one of my favorite drugs. And I ran this morning and I got huge amounts of serotonin, uh, which comes up. You get that flood of uh, serotonin when you're... Uh, in a crowd and you're watching a sporting event or you're watching uh, um, your, your favorite band, you get that flooding through. But that's me, that's what I like. But we're all slightly different. So positioning, how you position your story, how you start, how you present, you're creating emotions, you're creating your visual emotions, you're, evoking the emotions the only way you can really do that is using visual language as we discussed before and using your metaphorical influence around that to help them shortcut make them see things in a really quick way and you obviously how you explain things unifying you want to make sure that they remember you they want to make sure that they can talk about you to their clients, to their, their board members or whoever you're actually saying it to. So they get it, they understand it and they're emotionally connected to it. And the attention, story delivery, always go first. Show and tell, visualize your language, anchoring. What do I mean by anchoring? It's using specific words to put them so they remember certain things that they go bang oh remember that but we can go into a lot more detail about that be congruent what is being congruent we know that if you're presenting your language your tone your tonality i was speaking to a guy called joe navario the other day uh, he is the number one expert in the world of body language. He actually trains uh, the FBI and he trains other people like that. So there's a lot of statistical information out there. So your body language is around about uh, 55%. How you're using your arms, what goes on in your face, your eyes. It's that connection of trust when you actually say it. It's the congruence that meaning that if you're saying that you're open, your body language is open at the same time, and you ask you to smile with the eyes, and people can actually see that connection, that trust, that you are saying what you are saying is true. 
the next part is around about 30 percent of the tone your tonality how you speak how you pace and how you pause then it goes by listening but there's fluctuation between what is actually said and the actual percentages uh and again use your senses to help you so quick 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 thing i'm going to do for you um what i want you to do now and i know i'm running out of time as always so what i want you to do is remember everything on this list you ready let's go ice cream lion Empire State Building, TV, Umbrella, Train, Boxing Contest, Irish Flag, Wine, Paper Plane, Wedding, snow, journal, pizza, Thailand, balcony, bath towel, diet coke. Okay, I'm actually going to sit back here and if you can put in order how much did you remember? Ice cream, 50%. Oh, that's good, Simon, well done. You probably wrote it down, didn't you? Anything else? 25% maybe. That's pretty good, that's pretty good. It's better than what I did the first time I did this. Can I watch the replay? <laughs> First five to six. Okay. Look, I'm going through this quite quickly because I know we are short of time. 75, 75%. Wow, you're incredible. So what I want you to do now is uh, I remember the time that I love, I was in New York and I loved when I get there is to have my favorite ice cream. And there's an ice cream parlor that I always go to and I get the best, best ice cream. Absolutely love it. So I have my ice cream, but then I walk around the big square there and I know there's a zoo there and my favorite animal is the lion. I always take my time walking around there while eating my ice cream and looking at the lion and as I look, I can see in the distance the Empire State Building. It's another one of my favorite places to go and visit. So after I go there and I look at the Empire State Building, I go, wow, that is incredibly high. I get very nervous and I get a little bit vertigo when I see the Empire State Building. But, you know, I can always watch it on the TV at any time. So I don't actually have to go up there. I can just watch it from afar. But that's one of the things that I, I, I probably would do because I get a little bit vertigo. But you know, like in Ireland, in New York, it does rain from time to time. I know at the moment the hot temperatures, but when it, at the moment, I need to find the umbrella because it's thrown down with rain. And the subway is incredible this time of year, any time of year, to get onto the train and take a journey to different parts and different areas within New York. One of the areas that I remember last time is a big boxing match that I actually went to and I saw uh, two big contestants, and I can't remember their names now, but it was a fun fight, but it was good to actually watch them. Always, like I am English, but I've been living in Ireland for 18, 19 years now. So like I do fly the, the Irish flag, and again, as I was at the boxing match, I, I do like a little bit of wine every now and again, just to keep me going. It's one of the fun things that my son was doing the other day was actually creating paper airplanes. He actually created so many of them. Uh, I, I, I had to bin them. 
but uh, he created too many of them. But that's just a, by the sideline. And when we were in Central Park, we did actually see a wedding. And in wintertime, we know how much it snows. Uh, it's like ridiculously bad. And within the journal, within the streets, they always have those guys that are actually giving the, uh, the, the latest journals and the latest papers and everything else. Again, New York is famous for its pizzas. One of the places that I want to jump to next is Thailand. And I've been to Thailand many times. But I was watching that from the TV, from the balcony on the TV about the place that I love to go while wrapping around with my bathrobe and drinking Diet Coke. So how much did you remember? How much did you remember? From the first time to the second time. Much more, much more. And you know much more is because 70%. Story helps. Thank you. So I created a narrative around that to evoke your imagination, to evoke your memory, so you remember more about the story and everything else. So that is absolutely powerful. So the story of Virgin is these ups and downs, the opportunity and challenges, what's attracting people to our products and services. And we also work with us. We all should be nothing without our story. Virgin, we know, is a massive story. And Richard Branson tells his story and his narrative extremely well. Thank you, Sir Richard Branson. This is me, I'm done. I've condensed uh, a half, uh, half a day's workshop within 40 minutes. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna stop presenting. If you wanna find out more from me, visit my website, jasoncooper.io. Connect with me on LinkedIn, um, at jcooper1970. Please connect with me. If you want to find out more for what I do and how I represent and how I can make you more connectable, trustable, credible in front of your clients. And Simon, back to yourself. Well, thank you, Jason. That was a whirlwind tour of storytelling. There was so much information packed in there. Uh, and I, I don't know how you managed to turn half a day into uh, 30, 40 minutes. So thank you. And some great comments from people that have joined us here live today. And uh, yeah, it's great how people found that to be really, really powerful. I've taken quite a few notes. And uh, I really want to introduce, however, our speakers today who are going to join us on storytelling. So uh, Tamir Kadar, you're very welcome. Great to see you here. I know you were uh, joining us and uh, it's great that you're here as part of this round table so thank you for joining us yeah, thank you hello everybody and Doyle Bueller who I introduced you to earlier Doyle you're very welcome you're joining us from where today uh today I'm in Sydney Australia very good Tamir you're in London today I'm assuming yeah I'm, I'm in London at the university I've just finished a session <laughs> seminar so I'm very happy to join I could still hear Jason's amazing very good. Uh, session thank you very good. So look, let's kick off the discussion about storytelling. Uh, some of the points that I uh, noted was just the amount of different elements of the brain that are involved. And of course, when we add a story, it becomes much more powerful. But I want to throw it open to either Tamir or Doyle maybe to get us going. Have you any questions for Jason or have you any thoughts on what we've been talking about today in relation to how it applies in your world, in business, etc.? Uh, if I if I can go ahead, just because when I went, when when Jason was uh, listing all the things the brain feels, it is exactly what I experienced when I did an an experiment, um, connect with stories, uh, storytelling, networking events online. It was in 2021, so you know after that year of uh, lockdowns and everybody was a bit overwhelmed by all the networking meetings where we just enter the Zoom and introduce ourselves. I'm an accountant, I'm a marketer and so on and so forth. So at this um, session, we I said that we connect with stories. So I gave people one story idea, um, um, as, as, uh, you know, something to talk about, like what was the first job that you, you have been ever paid for? And, um, and I put them into breakout rooms. And it was amazing exactly as Jason listed all the things that, 
instead of simply telling each other what they do, they started to tell the story of their first job, for example, and they started to smile at each other. They started to mirror what the speaker was talking about. Trust was built much quicker. And when we came back to the big room and I asked people to tell the stories of the other person and not their own, they remembered exactly as Jason did now with us with the, with the ice cream and lime and stuff like that. And you know what? Normally you don't really remember what people do after talking to them and hearing that, okay, I'm an immigration lawyer or whatever, uh, but you remember these stories and you will be able to retell these stories to yourself and to other people. So it's, it's, it's just, as Jason was telling it, it's, I just I just remember this and wanted to share. So yeah, absolutely. And is it is it possible that I can forget the image of Jason in a bath towel eating ice cream in New York? <laughs> is, that, is that possible? Um, mm -hmm. Joking aside, uh, Jason made a point, didn't he, about the bit that I loved was when he was talking about connecting with people. And you, you, you spoke, Jason, about data, but then you spoke about connecting and an, how a narrative connects with the inside out, as opposed to the way a lot of people try to storytell from the outside in, coming in with numbers and statistics and facts. Whereas what you were talking about was narrative connecting from the inside you know getting into the brain and then working working the other way Doyle have you any thoughts on that when it comes to storytelling or what were your observations or thoughts or any questions that it's posed for you yeah no thanks um Jason for the wonderful presentation I'm kind of going along the lines of we're not I haven't found a lot of good storytellers and maybe Jason can kind of um, go into maybe some that might be good in the business world. And, and you said Richard Branson was definitely one of them. But what I've kind of experienced a lot and found is that most people, maybe you can kind of articulate how they're telling the story, but most people tell it like a, a founder's story of why they started the business and that kind of stuff. But to me, a story that really gets people going is one that kind of is that that journey of transformation, the Star Wars, you know, the Lord of the Rings, where it is, it's not about the business, that's just kind of a matter of fact item. And perhaps that's the data that we see here. But perhaps it's more of the stories that actually kind of bring people along that journey. It's not just about um, me and my business. Oh, we're great. We're a startup. We're doing this. We're doing that kind of stuff. But it becomes more of a narrative, like you mentioned, and a story of transformation that that's what they're actually going on. There was an element, wasn't there, about shortcutting straight straight to them. You know, Jason, you used the term shortcutting where, you know, by using analogies and metaphors, it was almost as though you were putting the other person into the story or the narrative, you know, um, which I thought was, which was interesting. Maria, have you any, any questions or thoughts on, on the conversation so far? I think you need to just turn the mic on there, Maria. It'll get you every time, the mute button. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, because I'm tapping at the same time at the yeah, chat. Yeah, I understood. Yeah. So I usually turn it off. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was saying that I thought it was really interesting when Jason was talking about, like, the first part, when he was talking about which uh, brain help us make us take decisions about the root brain, the instinctive one and all that. Because uh, I've been reading uh, quite a lot lately also because we were gonna have this conversation and I found so much information. And, and I thought it, it was really interesting how we process language and which parts in, in our brain are activated by you know, like different events and how the story develops into our brains, like the sensory cortex and the motor cortex, and it they activate just by words. Uh, and I think that's amazing. Like we say, depending on which words we use, you know, like uh, maybe we use um, action words and that will motivate our motor cortex uh, or we use sensory words and that will activate our sensory cortex. So maybe going back to what um, Doyle just said, if we use stories that have to do with our own customers and we say something like the client felt supported, like we talk about our own 
stories. Our latest client felt supported and taken care as if he was part, as if we were part of his own family. Maybe that way we're making this other person we're talking with also felt that we are a big family. We're making him feel part of something, you know, just with words. Obviously, this all needs to be inside a story because that's what we're talking. It's not just a sentence, it's a whole story. But just by using words and making them feel feelings, we can do that. So it's not only talking about Star Wars, you know what I mean? But yeah, like, yeah. if we let them know how we made all the clients felt something with their own experience into our company, we can do that. I'm, I don't know. What do you think, Jason? Is Would that be it? Or am I wrong? I mean, I might be. <laughs> no, you are right. Uh, what you suggested there. There's, there's lots of different ways that we can connect with our audience, uh, depending on who our audience actually is. If it's a meeting, um, we, we might want to take people through a journey of a, another client that we had mm -hmm. and find out their ups and downs and why things went well and what went wrong. And show your humbling side to your vulnerability as well. Even when you present your story to a client, things don't go right, especially when you're a startup. Things go wrong all the time. Tell people how things went wrong. Tell them the stress, the cortisol, what actually happened along the way. Maybe the big thing that changed things to make you understand how you got so many customers. All of a sudden, things went well. And then you rise it with the customers that you do have and take them on that journey. But that's just one. You can have several different other, uh, other stories, but it does depend on your audience that you do have. Every story is going to be slightly different. So you have to work out who your audience is, which it actually is. If you're in a meeting, ideal scenario is get them to tell them their story. Don't kill them off with death, uh, by PowerPoint. No one likes PowerPoint. Just have a conversation with them. Find out about them. Find out their value. Find out about their concerns. Tell them about how vulnerable that you are. Get that emotion going along. Get them to go straight inside your brain. So you build those emotionals and the, that story with that. Uh, I believe that if you make people emphasize with uh, the pain your other customers experience or you use... Uh, experience by building your own company, they will also feel the pleasure of your resolution or your customer's resolutions when you did help him, help them to overcome whatever it happened. And that will help you build uh, a strong relationship with those new customers. That's right. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, uh, Jason. Doyle, were you going to jump in there? Yeah, I was just going to say, is there a point though where storytelling becomes a bit too much in the business world where it's like, look, I understand it's a great story, but let's just kind of get down to business type thing and get stuff done. Like, where is that line? Um, or is there a line? I'm just, just really curious. I think it's a great question. Can we be, can we overtell the story? Overtell Jason, storytelling. You know? yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, like, it depends on the area uh, and the type of meeting that you actually have. Like, you don't want to overwhelm them with loads of stories. Because the meeting is about asking them questions and building up the value. Then once you get to a certain point in the meeting, yeah, you can build a narrative, you can build up a story, but it's, you're not going to overwhelm them with uh, a story unless it's uh, um, Disney or, or whoever it might be. Then, you, then yeah, absolutely. Uh, but it's a different pitch. Story um, in a meeting or a business meeting, it is asking lots of good questions but then you can build it into a narrative and then you ask a lot more questions and hopefully they build a narrative back when you ask them lots of good open questions because that's a slightly different context. And uh, Yeah. 
that's a good point and we've got some comments already coming in and I, i'll get to them for thanks to chris and to bernie bernadette i can see your comments i will come to that in a moment but i wanted to bring tamir back into the conversation a little bit if i can because one of the things that it's highlighted for me because you know i'm kind of immersed in the world of language and linguistics and localization and translation and all that good stuff but this term visual language it really has brought that to the focus for me and I'm just wondering, Tamir, in your world, because obviously you work an awful lot with key marketing people across uh, many parts of the world. What do you think when we talk about this using this visual language? Um, yeah, a very good question. And it also, I would also um, like to go back to what Doyle mentioned, that a lot of people are not telling good stories in the business world. And that they are, in a lot of cases, they are also a bit um, reluctant to use it, really. And this is because uh, they are not specific enough. And this is where I would bring in your visual words example, that if I focus on a specific example, and really use these visual words, which really uh, not just describe, but demonstrate what happened at that specific event or moment. So I'm not telling very general things that I've always been interested in interior design or something, but I'm just focusing and cutting on one specific event and using these demonstrative words that that works really perfectly and not just in meetings, but also on an about page or on a flyer or whatever, you know, on, as I said, in a networking or, or really um, pitch wherever. So absolutely. And this, this is sometimes it requires a little preparation and a little uh, research and, and because words really do matter. So you really have to be careful which one you choose, especially when you have time to prepare for that pitch or prepare for obviously whatever you write and put in writing. So yeah, this is what it means to me to be really specific and demonstrative instead of descriptive. Yeah, and it's positioning that story, isn't it, I suppose. Doyle, any more thoughts on that? Um, just I, I think that that's there's been a few points about making it very specific and like uh, Timmy was saying is is we don't want to have stories kind of rambling on we want to there is obviously a purpose so I think you have to pick and choose where you use them and where you leverage them and where you you know have sort of a, a strategic story that that's part of the journey um, you know as I was talking about earlier it's like make it more of a journey of, of a journey of transformation as opposed to just a story because if you look at like Gary Vaynerchuk for example like he's a great storyteller he focuses in on you know kind of the belief systems of of his audience so he can really tell some really great stories and you're captivated by it but at the same day same time rather we're not Gary Vaynerchuk so we kind of have to be very selective in how we tell stories and what we use them for and, and that sort of thing so we don't want to be you know, referred to as, as just somebody who, who rambles on about stories <laughs> as I ramble on. <laughs> well, look, I want, I've got some great questions now that are coming in on the chat. So thanks to everybody who's, who's posting now. I'm, I'm going to go into these and maybe our panel here on this round table, maybe you can jump in with your thoughts, uh, whether it's Doyle or Tamir or Maria or Jason. Um, so let me, let me hit the first one. And the first question is, should we have several stories prepared depending on our audience, just to be prepared for those different personality types. What's What are your thoughts on that, anybody? Can I just quickly jump in? I think yeah. uh, uh, being in sales or business, I think you have to have loads of experience stories that you can use at any particular time when you're speaking to customers, depending on the situation. So you can just bring loads of examples in about different customers or different situations. Um, that's what I would suggest to do. Alternatively, if you're on a big team, you can use other people's stories, but make sure that you tell them another customer had this experience and what they did was blah, 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 whatever it might be. So you can have that, but it, it does depend on the audience. Uh, I, can I just say that I totally agree with Jason. So I always prepare and obviously depending on who I will talk to I select a story which will match that person which that person can identify with and that person can see themselves in and again it needs preparation so storytelling in business is not necessarily something that I will just now you know wake up and come up with something but obviously it needs some kind of a research and preparation so I agree with this. 
Yeah. And I think you need to tie them together as well so that it becomes, again, uh, it's not one long story, for example, it's kind of a smaller sections of related stories it's like chapters for example like when i do a, a live presentation um you know in a, a theater or whatever the case may be it's it's i try to tell specific stories of each you know one or two slides kind of thing so in a business context i kind of get the point across by relating it to a story uh, a metaphor you know that kind of thing that allows people to kind of sync with it and and understand what what i'm talking about yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks, Doyle. And I, I just want to move it on if I can, just in the interest of time, because I want to get to some more of these questions. So Chris was saying that obviously he agreed with your earlier point on that and that stories need to be very on point because he's making the, the point that you can tell when somebody's just been on a course and told them to tell a story, right? So <laughs> that sort of authenticity <laughs> needs to kick yeah. in, right? It needs 100%. to be genuine, yeah. <laughs> relative, on point. And as you you know, it has to, you were talking about linking them together, right? You can't just throw a story in for the sake of it. So that's a good point. So thanks for that. Uh, another question is, um, use it the use of uh, social media in storytelling because you're limited to some degree depending on what platform you're on as to what you can uh, make an impression with um if you're limited you know is there any sort of tips or any anything we should use for storytelling in a brief but powerful way particularly around social media anybody want to jump in on that um, i mean hemingway hemingway had the six word stories so that's you can you can look look it up and there are you know in six words you can tell a story if you follow the so it doesn't have to be longer it's possible absolutely yeah that's that's why Twitter came if you can tell a story on Twitter you're you're pretty good uh, a writer or copywriter or whatever so yeah look I would say for social media it's you have to perhaps you can look at it for two from two different ways one is kind of an overarching story as jason kind of outlined because obviously it has to be very short very concise very precise as well so you can kind of do an overreaching story that kind of bridges between these different points on one post or multiple posts or that sort of thing and one of the cool things i've seen on twitter in the last like six to nine months is how they create these multiple threads um, in relation to telling a story, because as you know, with what is it, 200 and how many characters, 268 characters, uh, you have to be very specific as well. So we have to kind of adapt to the medium that we're using. So with Facebook, it's a little bit longer, but we can't kind of miss those principles that really kind of allow us to, to be able to convey that story as well. I've got an interesting question here that, you know, uh, I have imposter syndrome telling stories because English is not my first language. How important is the language and using the right words? So probably I can jump in here as English is not my first language, but my chosen one and that I've put a lot of effort into learning. And, you know, obviously language is important and you have to use words which the audience can identify with, but in a lot of cases it's in your head. The audience is usually happy with that so yeah obviously i you have to speak it to, to, to an extent and you have to prepare for it but in most cases it's in your head that english is not in not your first language really so that's but uh, yeah and and at the same time like just just practice like don't don't worry about it we I think we're all, I mean, know your audience, right? We've said that a few times and, and that your audience knows that maybe you're not a perfect speaker, but at least you're trying and, and you can kind of figure out the story along the way as well. So yeah, don't worry about imposter syndrome. Like just go do it and practice, right? Yeah, I'm not perfect in French. I, you know, grew up in a French family and that sort of thing and, and spend time in French cities um in canada but at the same time like i'm not a french speaker so i can comprehend it but you know what just get out there and practice i think if you understand the principles then then you will get better and you will use the right words um, i do agree when you try to express feelings i'm sorry sorry jason that I, I, when you try to express feelings i do have that problem sometimes that i'm trying to tell a story i'm trying to express my feelings or really telling them how it felt at that moment and English is not my first language and sometimes words are not the same I'm sorry I mean we do not have the same vocabulary and I just feel like I'm out of words and I'm like yeah you you know what I mean I would love to really express myself so that's maybe why I use my hands and my 
So maybe she can do that. Maybe she can use her body language to, I mean, now we have video chats, you know? So it's like, you can use your body language too and, and show them what you're trying to say. I know it's not the same when you're writing an article, but if she's in a video call or something with a client, maybe she can do that too. I don't know. Sorry, Jason. Thanks, Maria. That's Jason, right. you're going to say something? Imposter syndrome happens to us all. No matter of your language, it doesn't make any difference. I'm not good enough. I can't do that or whatever it might be. We all get it all the time. It's one of those things that we have to practice. I practice, 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 practice. I record myself, I video myself and I listen to myself all the time. Probably other people are getting sick of that, but I even close my ears and I listen to myself. I record myself, I video myself. I have to get over that. And the only way to get over imposter syndrome, and it happens to us all when you're public speaking, is the number one fear that builds up that cortisol in our brains. I'm not good enough. People are laughing. They don't know what you're going to say. So it doesn't matter. Use your personality. Practice, 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 practice. And I, I know we're all saying that. And we all agree about the first time I ever stood up in a public audience uh many years ago i was very no i was shaking almost swore then but i was shaking like a leaf but i knew that i practiced for about a week up to that uh and but we all get that but the only way to do it is actually stand up and do it that's why toastmasters and uh psa public um speaking is really good toastmasters is excellent for that just trying to get yourself over the, the pre-nerves, regardless of the language. I've seen some incredible people that don't speak native English. I can't speak Spanish, apologies. I can I'd probably get a beer, but that's as much as it can go. Well, look, thanks, Jason. It brings me on. I, I want to squeeze in one last question because I know we're really up against it for time here. And then I'm going to go quickly around the round table here and just get any of your thoughts just as we wrap up this round table. The last question, I just want to squeeze in one from Eleanor who asks, how important is it to begin with a personal story to illustrate your why to establish the know, like, and trust factor faster? So what about the personal story? Any, do you want to jump in on that? I was going to say that's uh, normally the hero's story, how you came to be. So that's a really good thing to do. It gets instant connection, instant likability. One of the child evening's laws of influence and persuasion is that connection, that likability, that trust. And when you're showing your vulnerability, that is just absolutely amazing. doesn't matter whether you're shaking, people actually jump into your brain and go, I've been there and we all have been there. So I think that's just, if you can do that, that's incredible. That's really, really tough to do. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree. And once again, it has to be specific. It's not just something general. So really demonstrating. And I really use it. So when I talk about, you know, how I, I, I started a business because of my dad and I explain it, which I won't do here. But what happened, I did it at a, at, a, at a networking event. And six months later, when I went back, people came to me that, oh, you were the one. And they remembered what I told them six months before. So absolutely. The only thing that we've already said that it shouldn't be a long, long, long story. You know what? Uh, covering everything since I was born and went to, you know, the schools. But yeah, it's a great idea. And I think that relates to what Jason said earlier. People were, you sort of had anchor points in your story and they could remember that story six months later, right? Yeah. That's really absolutely. relevant. Doyle, yeah. were you going to say something there? Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, yeah, it, it can be super important in terms of um, conveying that story and getting people to know, like, and trust you as well. So, uh, you know, like, Marvel does a pretty good job in DC Comics of it, of having, you know, the origin stories, which are can be pretty deep. You don't want to be able to to tell that length of story unless you have the audience and the platform and the medium but the point is is that yeah there's definitely some strategic advantage to doing like an origin story but put it in context and make sure that it kind of fits with that overall sense of you know what platform are you on and um what is sort of the medium of the presentation as well well, look, it's been fantastic uh, to be joined by everybody today. And I do want to thank everybody in the audience as well for their questions. Before we wrap up, I just want to go quickly around and ask Jason, Tamir and Doyle and Maria, do you have any last sort of comments on storytelling before I close this uh, roundtable today? 
maybe maybe uh, Tamir, can we start with you? Yes, I'd like to echo Jason. Practice it, and if and, and it will come. So that doesn't have to be perfect. First, practice it in a, a smaller team or just with one person as you talk to, and then you can grow. So it's really researching and preparation and practice. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you for being. Thank you for thank you. Thank you, Tamir. Doyle, maybe over to you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Simon. And uh, thanks, Jason, as well. Wonderful presentation. Um, and Maria as well for co-hosting. Um, I, I just want to make, you know, a specific comment in terms of just, just understand what it is your audience is looking for. So, you know, people didn't come here or people are listening to you for a certain reason. So make sure you kind of look at that strategically. I'm not just here to tell them about myself. I'm here to tell them about, you know, that journey of transformation as well. So be strategic in your thinking in terms of what, why am I telling this story, you know, and how is it going to move them along that journey as well? And uh, you'll have a much more receptive audience. Thank you so much, Doyle. Uh, Maria, any last thoughts from you? Well, I would say that in a world where we are bombarded by information, a great story helps you cut through the noise and grab the attention of customers who will at the end feel passionate about staying with you for the long term. So as we already say, use all the weapons you have, written words, oral words, body language, everything you can, you know. Thankfully, we're, we're in a world where we can video chat or we can write a post. Uh, so we have a lot of weapons that we can use on our behalf. So do it. A lot of, a lot of tools available. Thanks, yeah. Maria. Jason, last thoughts with you, sir. Any Anything you want to add just before we wrap up? I think I've probably said it already. <laughs> I, You've I covered a lot, Jason. You've covered an awful lot today. Yeah. Adding, adding humour. Uh, one of the key things is humour and smiling is another thing of likability. So adding that as and when it's uh, required just to make things a little bit light, depending on the situation. Thank you so much indeed. Well, look, that brings us to the end of this edition of the Think Global Forum Roundtable discussion. Please make sure to join the Think Global Forum newsletter that I mentioned at the start. So just head over to thinkglobalforum.org, register for the newsletter, and that way you can keep informed of any future events that we're running. Uh, and also be sure to connect with the Think Global Forum on social media. We're on all the normal platforms, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. So if you're not connected to the Think Global Forum there, please do. We'd love to have you join the community there. One additional final note from me is we will be launching the sixth year of something called the Think Global Awards later this year. Uh, so keep a lookout for that on all our social media and our newsletters. And you can always find out more about the Think Global Forum at thinkglobalforum.org. So listen, thank you very much indeed to Jason Cooper, to Tamir Kadar, to Doyle Bueller, to Maria Roja, and to everybody who's joined us today. We hope you've enjoyed this roundtable discussion on storytelling, and we hope it's put that topic of visual language uh, to the top of your agenda when you're considering storytelling going forward. So thank you, everybody. We hope to see you at another Think Global Forum event in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, bye.